Actually, I thought it was sort of ironic and, and fitting that there is a um, tornado warning as we're discussing your book, The Yellow House, which is, of course, about um, Hurricane Katrina and also about a great deal more than Hurricane Katrina. Um, everybody, this book is so extraordinary. And, and I'll just, in one sentence, if I can summarize it, it's about, it's about Sarah Broom's family. It's a multi-generational epic, truly an epic story about um, her family's history in, East, in New Orleans East, which differs quite from the New Orleans that many of us are familiar with, and we'll discuss that later on. Um, and it's the story of a yellow house, of a modest, small yellow house that her remarkable mother, Ivory May, bought in 1961 for herself and for her growing family when she was 19 years old, um, with the intent of, of, of owning a small piece of the American dream. And it's about what happens to the house and to the family in the years leading up to Hurricane Katrina, afterwards, the devastation, the diaspora and the displacement of the family after, and, um, and it's about the country itself. It is such an extraordinary book. And I wanted to begin by, by, by telling you that as I was reading this, um, several times in the opening chapters, I kept writing in the margin the word Homeric um, or epic. Mm. Um, this book felt to me like truly the Aeneid or the Odyssey. That is, mm -hmm. those are like the only books that I feel like I can rightfully compare the Yellow House to. And, and then when I got to the point in the book where you mentioned that you had terrible eyesight as a child and that you were nearly blind and you said that you realized that there was a point where you were able to um, realize by taking your glasses off and putting them back on again, you could go, you could see and become blind at will. When there were mm -hmm. things that you didn't want to see, you could take your glasses off. And when you wanted to see, you could put them back on. And I wrote in huge letters in the margins, Homer, Homer, yeah. she is yeah. like, she is the blind sage who is telling the story of this mm -hmm. devastation. And I wanted to open by a quote from the Aeneid to set the tone for what yes. I feel like the emotional tenor of this book is. And it's in book one of the Aeneid and Aeneas has left Troy after having seen his city destroyed. And he's taken his small ragtag band of survivors, which include his, his father and his son. And they've washed up as displaced people on the shores of North Africa in Carthage. And at the gates of the temple, he sees that they're building the temple and they've taken the story of the fall of Troy and they've embossed it into the walls of the temple. And he sees for the first time the story that he lived himself and that he mm -hmm. lived stoically and without, without breaking down. But once he sees it sort of written out and spread out, he collapses into tears um, and says, lacrime rerum, these are the things of tears, um, to see the whole story told. That's how I feel this book to be, wow. um, that these are the things of tears and that you are both Aeneas and Homer telling us this epic story of, of, of a horrible destruction of a city and a displacement of a people. And that is an enormous responsibility to carry on your shoulders. So I wanted to begin with that, with the idea of, of being the, the sage, the storyteller mm -hmm. and holding this entire massive story in your own responsibility, the story of your family, the story of your city. Um, how did you find the confidence, the courage, mm -hmm. um, and, and the endurance to be able to tell this story, which is a thing of tears and beauty? I think it's, um, it's profound to me. I'm thankful to you for mentioning Homer and the Aeneid in, in specific. I was digging in my notebook, which is right next to me, because today I found actually a quotation from there that I was hoping I could find and read about uh, Lethe, right, and forgetfulness. Um, and, you know, that's so interesting to me because so much of the work for me was thinking about how you layer something which is itself, but then also is not itself, right? Um, it, the, you know, there's this moment in the section about water, which I'm thinking a lot about these days, that's very Dante's Inferno and keeps sort of wrapping around itself. And, and I sort of find myself having had at some moment, and I think you understand this well, Liz, the courage to begin the writing work, but then completely slayed and overwhelmed by it and feeling 
very also lost in my own story and feeling also that I didn't have the right to it as much as I wanted to tell it that somehow it wasn't exactly my story to tell. And um, all of that felt to me resolved in my own sort of efforts to make something that exceeded the banal. And, and I think that, so that position as, um, as witness, as sage, as, you know, maybe you're the first person who ever got the blindness reference, the sort of hugeness of that story for me. Um, and how with such difficulty, you know, you're trying to take this real, that these facts and, and really craft a story that, that sort of rises above the facts and arcs and dips and has tragedy and, and also scenes, which is what I think about when I think of Homer, right? And, 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 and is a journey um, and gets lost and gets found again. I want to talk about the idea of who has the right to tell a story. Um, you are the youngest of 12 children. And in your family's parlance, the babyest, mm -hmm. um, which I thought was very dear and also kind of heartbreaking. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and one of the lines that you say early on in the book is that, um, I, I can't remember now whether you said it or whether it was said about you, but babies don't need to understand. Um, th there's a, a, a sort of family idea that you were this very willful, very, like your descriptions of your own childhood. To me, it reads mm -hmm. like... Um, Dylan Thomas, uh, Child's Christmas in Wales. You, you create a sense of space so much that I feel like I know New Orleans East. I know mm -hmm. that house, I know your family. And you were this questioning child and a curious mm -hmm. child. Um, and then later in life, you became the writer and, and the storyteller. You, you weren't in New Orleans when Katrina happened. Your brother Carl um, was, and he was deeply caught up in the horror of, of what happened when the city flooded. In a way, the, his descriptions of, of what was happening to him are so mm -hmm. devastating to read and brought back to me those, the, that time of seeing those images of people as he was stranded on their rooftops, days on end with no food and water. Um, you know, how did your family take it? How do you, how do you approach them? I, I believe you were thinking about writing a book about this house even before could, Katrina came, mm -hmm. but, but how, how do you find that? Um, and how did those conversations go? A lot of the people watching this are, are writers or people who want to be writers and, and thinking about how we write about our families is one of the most difficult things for, for a writer mm -hmm. to, to face. So I wanted to know if you could walk us through that. So originally the story that I wanted to write was, was about this yellow house and, and the sort of ways in which I felt very haunted by the physical structure itself. Even after I left it, it, it was sort of, I felt so tethered to this sort of shotgun house and friends of mine. And this is like when I'm 18, 19, 20, right? Um, I'm 40 now. Friends of mine would say, you know, you're treating this house like it's a national landmark or something. And I'd say, but I just can't shake it, right? Um, and, and I thought about, I started writing about the architecture of the house, wanting to sort of crash this notion and idea that only certain houses in New Orleans have importance, right? Um, and then in 2005, Katrina happened. And the story sort of shifted in a sense because now I, I was talking about this place that had first been pummeled in 2005 and then in 2006 demolished without any of our knowing it. And something about the loss, the absence of the house itself triggered an entirely new response in me as a writer. And I realized that the thing that I actually wanted to write was an autobiography of the house. Mm. And, 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 you know, if I could sort of, if the house could sort of tell the stories of itself, if, you know, I was obsessed then with the paintings of uh, Whitfield Lavelle and he, he draws these wonderful pencil sketches 
on wood and it's these sort of ghostly people you know talking through the walls and you know i think the tricky part then was how do i take the sort of five family stories that i've been told over and over again and actually sort of get to the bottom of them and so that led me to to embark on actually a year of um reporting and and, and i mean really reporting where i um, you know, got with all of my family members and just with rigor um, interviewed them and, and really got to sort of a lot of the heart and the detail and spent so much time in libraries and in archives and driving to Raceland, Louisiana, where my family was from and feeling still like I was trespassing the entire yeah. time. Uh, feeling that way, feeling... Um, really scared in the days before the book was published still, even though I had taken such care and, you know, involved my family as much as I could. And, you know, it was just really, really difficult, I think, along the way. But the question I asked myself was, are you putting yourself on the line? And if you're putting yourself on the line, rightly so, right? Um, you can take care with your family. Tell me what you mean by putting yourself on the line. I think not shying away from my own, the things that felt private to me, that felt scary to me, the places where I didn't want to go. To talk about shame um, still creates in me just as an adult woman, right? Such hesitation and trepidation, fear. Uh, and I want, you know, I want to sort of not go there. I, I didn't even want to remember um, the loss of my father and what that actually meant for me, these vulnerable moments when I'm, I feel like an infant again, right? I'm, I feel quite infantilized or, or hiding a house, you know? How, what does it mean to be a child hiding a house um, and, and how I can feel that in my body, even when I talk about it, um, wanting very much to be, to present a self um, and knowing very well that, that this was not about a presentation of self, right? That, that I was driving to something. Let's talk about that, about the shame and the presentation. Um, and for that, we have to talk about, God, I want to go in a million directions here. Um, for that, we have to talk about your mother, your, your, your incredible mother, Ivory May, who bought this house when she was 19 years old and, mm -hmm. and who was so proud of it and, and took such care of it and had such a sense of beauty and who was mm -hmm. able on, on such a small amount of resources to bring elegance and beauty. There's a line in your book about elegance. Um, it's actually something that you spoke about your mother, um, or sorry, your grandmother, um, mm -hmm. that you said that about your grandmother, that she learned to find the numinous in the everyday. Mm -hmm. When the presentation of the body stands in for all the qualities the world says you cannot possess, some people call you elegant. That line stopped me on the page. Um, you come from a line of women of black women who have been told by the world that they cannot have elegance mm -hmm. and who have it anyway and who have it at great cost who who sacrificed a great deal to present to the world a certain um a certain elegance a certain respectability um to make sure that their children were immaculately dressed that that you know you're, there's a line in the book where your mother says when people read this and they hear the house that we were living in they won't believe that that was the same people they knew on the outside um, so talk about that. Talk about um, what it what it meant for your mother when the house went into decline, where even she, with all her resourcefulness, could not mm -hmm. keep it together anymore, and it became something that was a source of shame. I mean, this is so interesting because all of the women, you know, and I grew up in this very maternal world, and I got the feeling that this is the self these people were presenting was also who they ultimately were. Right. And that there was some way in which they figured out how to become bigger or greater than any one story that someone could tell about them. 
mm-hmm. right? And and I think even for my mother, the the creation of this home, the getting of this home was like, okay, now I can make a world that looks like me and feels like me, right? Uh-huh. And that safe somehow for these children. But then also getting very confused in their own desire to be part of this sort of American narrative. And uh, I think the tricky line is when those things begin to stand in for who you are Mm. um, as a human being, right? And so for my mother, for instance, you know, the house, as she says, was sinking on the day they moved in, right? Mm. They were already building it back up. So there are all of these structural and systemic issues the ground itself was soft right right? and so but even with all of those structural and systemic issues she still took everything that all of the houses dilapidation and what i now know entropy all houses are entropy right from moment one the only question is do we have the resources to (laughs) sort of sort of fix the stuff as it's going down right um And I think for my mother, she began to confuse the house with essentially her own self. Um, And, and we felt that confusion, I think, Mm -hmm. as it as it sort of showed up and appeared in shame as shame. There's a line in your book where you say shame creeps in slowly like water. and then there's a, you repeat that line later and say it, it starts slowly and then it becomes violent. Mm-hmm. And, um, and it reminds me of that very famous, often quoted Hemingway line of, of bankruptcy, that it's, it's something that begins, it happens slowly and then all at once. Yes. Um, and, and same thing with the, the sort of environmental destruction of, of, of New Orleans East, which, as you point out, flooded first in Katrina. Um, you know, the water comes down there first and, and rises slowly and then all at once, you know. Um, and as I was reading about your mother's shame, which was so heartbreaking because it was so, um, it's so unfair um, that somebody as elegant and intelligent and resourceful and good as your mother would ever have to experience shame because she happened to be living in a house that was falling apart for reasons that had nothing to do with her. Um, and I remember when I read that as that, as her shame progressed in the book and she got to a point where she wouldn't let people come in the house anymore because she didn't want anyone to see how you were living. I wrote in the margins, it's always the wrong people in America who are ashamed. Mm. It's always the, like, it's always the wrong people. The people who should be ashamed are never ashamed in America and the people who shouldn't be are. And, um, and it, was so, it was so heartbreaking to, to hear of that. And, and I wondered if your telling of this book, in a sense, taking everything that had been hidden from misplaced shame and opening it up and turning it into a work of beauty and really a work that really honors your mother, um, was that an answer to that shame, that, that, wrong, that wrongness, um, that deep moral wrongness of the fact that your mother should have ever had to experience that sensation? Well, I think it gave me the chance to, you know, my favorite thing is context. I like context in every aspect of my life. I never, you know, to be out of context feels like displacement to me. Mm. And I, for people I love, I want to see them in context and I want to see the house in context. And it was really important for me to look at the underbellies of all of these things that we take for granted and really say, but what was the actual foundation of this thing? How did it get to be this way? Um, You know, how did New Orleans East, this great promise of a place become this abandoned place subject to so much name calling. And I I think the exercise of going to the city planning office, going to the zoning commission, which is the reportorial part of me, there was a way that I could make a case, so to speak, for, and, and, and take the blame that my mother felt 
and and put it elsewhere and say but this is official negligence that has been going on for hundreds of years um and and that's not to say that there weren't things that could have been done right to maintain this house but but you know the decks are stacked and 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 you know some of us struggle to get into a house and the chances of us maintaining that house are nil i mean i was saying to a friend last week you know i have a big family of new orleans people you know no one owns a house i mean i have a tiny little house no one owns a house you know there is something fundamentally wrong with this setup where natives in a city where natives struggle to own if that's what they want, right? Um, and so in the book, trying not to do a sort of hagiography hey right. when it came to my mother, to be honest about what makes her real, right? But then also to say, ah, this burden, which as you were talking about it, I felt all over again, this feeling that we were failing, you know, as humans that it maybe is not a feeling that belongs to us. I had a feeling of her as somebody who took such good care of things. Um, it was so important for her to take good care of things. She took good yeah. care of herself. She took good care of her home. She took good care of her children in a society that did not take good care of her. Um, and, and I wonder if how you're, if you, if you're able to say how your mom feels about that at this point in her life, um, about the very culture that she lives in. I don't know if that's too broad a question or if you shouldn't be speaking for her, but I'm curious about that because she, she went into her home owning experience as so many people do with nothing but optimism and a sense of belonging. I get to have this. I mean, mm -hmm. when, the, when there's a line you quote in the book, when the, when the development that you grew up in was built in the 60s, um, it says, uh, where is it? The reporter and me. <laughs> I can't find, okay, here it is. Here lies the, um, one of the brochures of it said, here lies the opportunity for the city's furthest expansion toward the complete realization of its destiny. I mean, they're using the language of manifest destiny there. Manifest. You know, the, the, the actual American dream, we're gonna spread out and take this whole thing and mm -hmm. we're gonna settle it all and there's gonna be room for everybody. You know, why wouldn't your mother have felt like she had a part of that? And when I, when I think of how that story ended with that house being demolished when none of, none of its owners or inhabitants even knew that the bulldozers were coming, when, when everybody had been dispersed to four or five different states, um, when your mother had to wait how many years for a settlement um, a after that? Uh, 20, I think 11 years or so. 11 years, right? That's how that story that began with such promise mm -hmm. ended. And, um, and I wonder what her, what is her emotional state around that? Is there bitterness in her? Is there, is there a kind of resolution? How does a person, how does a person make sense of that um, at the end of a long life of a lot of hard work? Well, you know, it's interesting. My, my grandmother, my mother's mother, Amelia, um, who we call Lolo, was always renting houses. And my mom actually got her house before my grandmother actually bought her own house. When we moved into, it was a big deal when grandma bought this house in a town called St. Rose, where she was born. And, you know, I remember being a little girl and there would be like nuclear brochures on the porch. Like, you know, if there's a nuclear explosion, do X, Y, and Z. And, you know, we sort of like threw them away and didn't think very much of them. And, and then we realized, oh my goodness, my grandmother is like very, her house is in an area of Louisiana that is now dubbed Cancer Alley with all these petrochemical refineries. And, you know, all of these sort of environmental dangers. And I, I'm saying that to say that my mother, in, in some way, lives in a world where the people she knows and the people she loves are constantly under a kind of assault. Um, and, and this feels, I think, very, like for many of us, I think, not surprising. Right. And, you know, 
so I think my mother was shocked maybe that she ever got anything mm. for the young house in terms of payment. Wow. That, you know, and, and the options were very stark. You know, she could get a small amount, the smallest amount for living elsewhere. No one else lived on the block. Or she could get the largest amount for building on the ghostly street. And of course, she wanted to have neighbors and a kind of life of the street happening, right? She didn't want to live on a street and be one of three houses. Yeah. So to make the choice that actually suits your life was a kind of, you know, downgrade, actually, for her. But my mother is, is a positive, joyful, spry, you know, human. Um, and so she wants to believe, I think, in the way in which we can all be our, our better selves. But the systemic things, she's no fool about that. She, can, she couldn't possibly be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not, not with 12 children. No, no. She, couldn't po <laughs> she couldn't possibly be. Um, oh, um, Sarah, I wanna, I wanna talk about, um, I wanna talk about the structure of this book. Um, just writer to writer. So you and I, um, we were, we were both writers at the late, now late, great O magazine for yeah. for a long time. And I've admired your work for a long time. And and the world admires this book. I mean, everyone, if you're just joining, we're discussing Sarah M. Broom's book, The Yellow House, um, which won, for instance, the National Book Award for nonfiction, <laughs> um, the highest award in the land. Um, you know, the, such great admiration for this book. And so on a technical level, whenever I get a chance to talk mm -hmm. to another writer, I always want to know how they did it. And I also know that there are a lot of people, again, on this line or who will be watching this video who, who are, if not, um, if not writers, really fascinated with the art of writing. And, and what struck me about your book um, and what I admired about it is that it felt like it was three books. Um, that it was, there, there was the beginning part, which was the this historical, um, you know, deep dive into family, your family history, um, which was fascinating. Going back almost a hundred years, containing almost a century of your family's history um, in, in New Orleans and how they ended up physically and emotionally where they ended up. Mm -hmm. um, and then the middle of the book is of course the storm, um, which you give the, the it feels like the smallest amount of pages to, but mm. if it was an EKG map, you know, <laughs> if you were to EKG map out this book, it, that's the spike, right? Like, mm -hmm. and, and there's a sense of it coming. We feel it building. We know what's coming and the people in the book don't. And that's always, there's always so much drama in that as a reader where you're like, run, Carl, no, you know, like you're, you know, I'm watching your brother <laughs> decide like, like so many people do who live in hurricane and tornado areas. Like it's just another one. It's not a big deal. And I'm like, no, no, you know, and you yeah. know, you know how bad it's going to get. Um, and, and that's so vividly told. And you turn the book over at that point, mostly to your family members to let them mm -hmm. tell their own stories of what happened. And I think a lesser writer might have capitalized on the drama and the glamour of tragedy and sort of ended the book very quickly right after that mm -hmm. um, in, in its high point, at its EKG high point. But the journalist and the sociology nerd in you um, did this very remarkable thing, which is then to take the last third of your book and do this deep sort of public policy examination. You know, you're like scenes of you mm -hmm. going, going and finding maps of how did the city get built and where did these people be d displaced to and, and what, what it was, what the aftermath was. And you, and you're such a powerful writer that it's just as fascinating to read that as it is to read um, about the storm. And um, I just wanted to just take my hat off to you on that, um, that, that you, you dared the reader to be as interested in finding out what had happened and why than we were in the drama of the storm you and and i'm so glad you did um because mm. the, the last third of the book is the stuff that i feel like we really need to know as americans um the part where you're in the zoning office saying to them how is it possible that there is industrial building in a residential zoning area you know we don't normally see this kind of stuff in a memoir <laughs> you know, but, but i want to know that we need to know that because that's how 
poverty stays entrenched. That's how systemic racism works. That's how it happens that your family ends up in Cancer Alley um, and, and generation after generation. So tell me about the epic of writing this. I mean, this is a huge amount of research. How did you, did you know that it was going to be pieced together in that way? How did it take its shape? <laughs> it was a very long question. Thank you for so, your patience. <laughs> I'll take my that, question off the air, caller. This is my, fa <laughs> my favorite thing to talk about. Okay, cool. Do it. <laughs> um, because the architecture feels like the most important thing, right? Right. And so it's sort of the container and I can sail all these ideas on this boat of the structure itself. And so I knew that I wanted a kind of structure that contained music. So I didn't want to say I'm from a musical city. I needed, so I needed a few realities of the book to ride along in the structure. One of them was that this is about a place that's on sinking ground. So the foundation is bad. Right. And, and, and there's a lot of movement. There's displacement and forced migration and, and, you know, movements of choice. And, and so the movements were, when I landed on the movements, at first I had like some crazy number of movements, but finally I landed on four movements. And I wanted these movements to almost feel like individual books the way like if you're at a concert or, or, or more aptly if you're listening to a 14 minute Fela Kuti song okay. right that you feel that you can sort of remove each one okay uh, it makes more sense I think if you think orchestra or but you could take each one out read it and be done but it obviously gets more interesting right um, if you read them all together and so um you know, trying to figure out, for instance, how to write a memoir where I'm kind of omniscient for the first part of it in a way, because there is a way that in the, the chronology and structure itself, I want to know these things, um, but I don't actually want to be actively in the narrative because I want to make a point about the kind of ground that needs to exist for my appearance because that because then the you way. show up as a character you stop yeah, being because the then omniscient I can say, I and then you arrive as a child yeah I Got arrive it. and I, I don't come from the clouds right. that I am born into a set of ideas right. and dysfunctions and systemic injustices and lineages that that I myself am carrying forward right um and that part is very like John Edgar Wideman this sort of um biblical this one had that one and and right. it also requires a lot of begats <laughs> a lot of begats it's, it's so <laughs> biblical in that way but I think also to say to the reader or to indicate to the reader that we're going to slow down a little bit because this is actually the most important thing that you need to know and 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 that once you get through it the rest of it will actually speed up because there's so much you know that it's sort of impossible to understand the rest unless you slow down and get this piece and i tried to move move it so that the beginning of the book was i am 5 and and it just didn't no. make it didn't make the book i meant to make and when we come to to movement three, which is water. So that's a really important movement because it indicates this is not the end all be all for these people mm -hmm. or, or even for me as a writer. Mm -hmm. that, that Katrina is only one of many calamities to befall this family, right? The, the husbands dying are calamities. Betsy is a calamity. The sinking ground is a calamity. And Katrina's yet another calamity that induces, it's almost like all of the calamities build. And so Katrina, I wanted to put it in context and allow it to sort of do this spinning out. It creates this spinning out feeling for me in the work. And then finally, movement four, do you know what it means or investigations? 
you know, do you know what it means is after the Louis Armstrong song, do you know what it means to miss New Orleans, miss you know? Mm -hmm. And, but that, this was the, this was more of a sort of Zeboldian section where I am a totally different person in a way than I have been in the rest of the book. And I just allow myself mm. to follow questions. So I, I follow a question and of course it never gets answered because there are no answers really. And then I ask another question and it's just a series of questions and scenes and, and, I think I like it the most of the entire, you know, of the entire book, because it's, it's the moment I get to do my like, you know, and Joan Didion, where I was from, she, you know, asked these series of questions about California and what it means right. to be from there. But, but she doesn't ask them directly. She asks them through these sort of abstract sideways and, um, that that sort of end is it where I go and I live in this beloved part of the city, the corner of Royal right. and St. Peter, across from where Tennessee Williams wrote Streetcar Named Desire as a black woman and make a perch on my balcony and and say, Okay, what's it all about? Tell me. I wanna know. What's the thrill? You know? And I sort of try to find out for myself. And it's a part of the city that you didn't know because of how different New Orleans East is from the New Orleans, and I'm sorry, I'm from Connecticut, New Orleans, New Orleans, I'm saying it. The, like the French Quarter. The, 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 yeah, I'm sorry, whichever way I'm saying it, I'm sure I'm saying New Orleans wrong. <laughs> New Orleans! Um, <laughs> But your state, you know, you, you, you return after to the part of the city that most of us, if we think of the city, that's the only part of it that we think of. Mm -hmm. um, and I found that really fascinating as well. Like, and, I, and I remembered, you know, the first time I ever came to New Orleans I, was in 1994. And you write about 1994, 1995, and, and the way that the city was splintering and, and breaking apart. And there was a crime, there was so much murder and crime and violence and corruption. And you know, I didn't see any of that. I came there and I was like, it's so pretty. I love the gardens. Look at these balconies. The music's amazing. Great food. What an amazing place. Um, and, and you can become, you write in the book about how people can become so captivated, almost seduced by, by New Orleans beauty and its yeah. specialness that, that, it, that we don't see its, its damage. Um, and what I remember most from that trip, aside from the food and the music, is that I was walking down the street and I had, a set, all of a sudden I was hit by vertigo. Um, and it was because I looked up and I saw a ship above me. And, um, and, and I couldn't make, my brain couldn't make sense of it and I literally almost fell over. Um, because it was so disorienting. There was a ship, there was a boat going past me mm -hmm. and it was higher than me. Mm -hmm. There is no universe in which that is okay. There shouldn't be, <laughs> there shouldn't be boats above you. you know, like I, I'm hole. not a physicist, but I know how water works. I was like, why is that up there? And I'm down here. And I felt, it made me feel like I felt this lurching sickness. And it's, it's the memory that I take away from New Orleans of, yeah. oh, it's so beautiful. I love the music. Oh my God, why is there water up there? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and so much of your book is about why is there water up there? What are we going to do about that? Um, and I wonder, I wonder how you see your city now in the rebuilding. After, after Katrina, you came back, um, after you went on a very unexpected side plot to go to Burundi to work at, at the advice of the great Samantha Power on, mm -hmm. um, on, on working with displaced people so that you could learn more about displaced people. You came back as a displaced person yourself to your city and you worked for um, the mayor in writing scripts for him, writing speeches mm -hmm. for him about how the city was coming back. And there's a point in the book where you say you were writing things that you knew weren't true, that you couldn't believe in yourself, that the city wasn't mm -hmm. going to come back the way it was. Mm -hmm. um, how do you see New Orleans now, um, all these years down, down the road, post-Katrina? I know that's a vague concept, but, but what do you make of it now? Oh, you know, you know, going and working in City Hall. So that was 2008. And, you know, I was so, it, I think just to say briefly what happened to me when I was in Burundi, because I was so naked. I, 
I really didn't have any story to tell about who I was. I was just sort of there in my foreignness. And then to come back home with these sort of great intentions. And, and even after City Hall, I went on a kind of nonprofit. I had years of working for nonprofits after that because I sort of felt that I had D done the wrong thing in a way by being in this sort of political world but being there helped me learn the machinery and it was just massively dysfunctional and nothing quite worked the way that it was supposed to and you know I read um, George Orwell's The Politics um, of the English Language <laughs> sort of on repeat during those years right because I was actually putting words in this politician's mouth. I was not being a writer as I had imagined myself trying to be, but I was sort of making words for this person who maybe would or wouldn't read them. And these words I knew were not true because I was talking to my siblings and the friends of my siblings and my pretend siblings many, many times a day and, and, and hearing about the situation in their lives. And some of them were living in trailers that had formaldehyde in them. And, you know, people didn't have water or trash pickup. And so this created in me a kind of warring. And I, mm. and I feel now as I sort of felt then, which is, you know, New Orleans is a quite small place. I mean, the population is maybe 450,000 or so now. You know, that's pretty tiny if you think of even how many people live in Harlem, right? Right. Um, and, and so I think that there should be systems that work a lot better for that few people. There should be the, the great chance for every child there to get an exceptional education. I mean, I grew up in the public school system and you know I'm one of the only people left I don't even know how else to say it my uh, childhood friends the people I grew up with you know I visit them in jail or in prison this is injustice this is deep injustice there is no way um, being the human being I am that that feels like making it to me or success, I, I think. Um, so I'm always looking back and, and thinking about, well, why aren't the systems working yet? Right. What, what, what is going on with 400,000 people that you know we don't have a real plan for the economy, for you know all of my siblings who are still struggling, all of the people still really working two or three jobs? Why, why is that? Why hasn't that changed any yet? And what will it actually take? You quote that, what is the number? 100,000, how many people left New Orleans never to return? I think at the time it was about 85,000 had not so, come, which is a lot. That's out like of a city that's just over 400,000? You know, it's a huge amount. And, and prior to that, one of the statistics I found so um, heartbreaking in your book was that prior to Katrina, New Orleans had the highest population of native citizens of any city in America. And I wanted to ask mm -hmm. you to unpack that statistic. Is that because people, why was that? Is it because people love their city? So that it's, there's nothing like New Orleans. You can't go there, many cities in America are similar. New Orleans isn't. <laughs> um, so I wondered, is part of that that like you can't replace it with something else like it? There's nothing like it. Is that why it was? Or was it poverty that was keeping people there? Was it? Um, and of course, that number's not, that's not true anymore because so many people left and never returned. They, you've spoken of your own family. They either found jobs in, in mm -hmm. Houston or in California or in Florida or someplace else where they were shipped. Um, often they just found jobs where they landed. On those, on those buses that were, were taking them out of the, the mm -hmm. Astrodome um, and never came home to rebuild their homeland. Um, yeah, so I, I was, I guess I was wondering like, what, what was it, what do you think that is? Why do you mm -hmm. think that New York had, or sorry, that um, New Orleans had the highest population of native inhabitants of any city? What was it that kept people there? It's a very, very 
villagey, community-based city. And like in my family, you know, for as far back as we know, there's no moment where we don't know a Louisianian in New Orleans, right? It's just like, for people who are so community-based, who, you know, really knows the neighbor, who, re I think that's why gentrification has been so jarring. I think that's why, you know, New Orleans is the only um, place in America that has an all-charter public school system. So kids are literally taken from their neighborhoods and bus to charter mm -hmm. schools in whatever lottery pick they received. I, I think those things have, have been detrimental to the kind of structure of a place where people really looked out for each other and had social and pleasure clubs where right. if your husband was sick and you didn't have insurance, right, that, that your social and pleasure club would, would step in for you and take care of you. And, you know, we walk around and we say, good morning, how are you? That's why I live in Harlem, because it's all these right. Southerners. You right. Say good morning. And what's wrong with you? You're not saying good morning. Um, and, you know, I think New Orleans is a place that is so specific. People have a certain palate, you know, a, a certain way of eating. They like a lot of seafood. They, all of those things make it very, very specific and generationally, right? Because it has such a strong history with free people of color, with Black people in America, with all of these people coming from elsewhere. It's just the sort of place that I think you get very, very attached to and connected to. It, the culture is so strong. And for my siblings who came back after Katrina, they will tell you, they, they didn't come back for the low pay scale or you know, the crazy possibility of getting carjacked. They came back for, um, because they missed the city. They missed the way people talk to you and the food and the way you can get a certain hot sausage at the grocery store, right? So I, I think that that is very real. And I wanted in the book, to also acknowledge this way that I am such a New Orleanian, that it is my city, that I also love it. Um, but it's sort of like that film, you know, The Last Black Man in San Francisco. You know, if you love a place, and Baldwin said this, you, your job is to critique it. Right. That's, that's the work. Right. And the city that you wrote about um, in this book has never been written about before. You kept looking for references to New Orleans East in, in literature, in tourist pamphlets, in, in it, it, it hasn't existed. You're, you're the first one to tell of it. Um, the city that I know as a tourist and that all of us know as a tourist has been sung about, written about, <laughs> plays about, <laughs> movies about, TV shows about, like, we all feel like we know it. Um, but what does it feel like going back to this idea of carrying on your shoulders the burden of the story or the, or the gift of the story um, mm. to, to be the one who is responsible for telling the story of New Orleans East to a world who had never heard of it and didn't care about it. It didn't know that we should care about it. It, it, it. I guess I don't make a distinction about it because I've always been drawn to these, the stories that nobody really thinks are worthy mm. of acting really being talked about or told. And New Orleans East is American history. Yeah. It's America. And and I thought not only is it a place that people are acting like doesn't exist, it's like all the places in America that people are acting like doesn't exist. It's right. Friends. It's right. it's it's all the places we know right that most need our care most need our our eyes most need our vision most need our attention right it's all of those places and i you know i think often you know what it's sort of exciting when i hear people say new orleans east because you know it's really rare to hear new orleans east coming out of someone's it's nice to hear it come out of your mouth um <laughs> But, but I think beyond that, when I think New Orleans East, I think of my nieces and my nephews and all of my siblings who still live there. And, yeah. you know, my neighbor, Rachel, who's still on the short end of the long street. 
and mm. how real these people are. Yeah. Me, how they were real to me then and they're real to me now. And and I I guess I see it as my mission to train my eye on these places that are are right there for us to see, but which yeah. tell a truer story of the place where we live. And so therefore we sort of avert our eyes. Um, to train, you train our eyes on it as well. You know, that's, that's, that's the great power that you've, that you've done with this book. Um, are you familiar, this may seem like a, a departure, but let's do it. Have, um, are you familiar with the, the Crohn's of Chernobyl? No. So I thought about them when I read about your brother, Carl. So, so your book begins and ends with Carl. Um, who's, who's um, your brother who rode through the storm with his two heroic dogs. There's an image of one point of him um, walking his dogs through post-apocalyptic New Orleans and he's, he's got no leash, he's got no food, he's got no clothes, he's got nothing, but he's taken the shoelaces out of his shoes and tied them as a leash to, to the dogs and he's hunched, a big tall man, he's hunched over <laughs> walking his tiny dogs to keep them safe. Um, and I thought, wow, his life has literally been reduced to a shoestring. Like it's a literal shoestring, like your whole, you know, the way that your mother lived on a shoestring and now it's down to like a hunched man with a shoestring mm -hmm. and all he's got left are these two dogs. And he's so, he's so, Carl's so um, vivid in this book and, and, and his loyalty to that little piece of land where your, where your mom's house was, that at the beginning of the book, the house is gone, it's been, it's been raised. There's nothing there but grass and the one tree that your father planted. And, and there he is, he set up a table and a chair, he mows the lawn, he sits there, he keeps watch over the ground itself. And, um, and, and at the end of the book, you come back to him keeping watch over the ground itself. And it reminded me of, um, so after Chernobyl, there was a massive displacement of humanity, obviously, everybody who was, mm -hmm. who was um, the people who were native to the area around the nuclear power plant were, were forcibly moved out to the cities for a long, long while. And um, recently, this small group of old women who feel they no longer have anything left to lose and they have no, really no fucks to give <laughs> because they've survived. They survived World War II, they survived Stalinism, they survived starvation, they survived Chernobyl. Um, they've returned. They, they, um, and they returned without anyone's permission to the most radioactive place on earth. And they're elderly, they look like, if you look at pictures of them, they look like babushkas in a fairy tale. They're elderly, elderly women wow. and they're thriving. Um, and they're outliving their contemporaries who remained in safe places in the city where they were relocating. Wow. And they're growing vegetables on radio, the most radioactive place on earth. If you run a Geiger counter over these women, it, the Geiger counter almost explodes. Like they are completely nuclearly, they're completely radiated. They eat the vegetables, they drink the water, they, they live off the land. They would turn to their old villages, they set up their old houses again in these dilapidated places that are full of ruin and there's just this little cluster of them and they're killing it and they're wow. and they're happy and um because they're home and mm. and they're actually not getting cancer um it's weird and their contemporaries who are in this the the soviet built apartment blocks in the cities who were kicked off their land are dying younger than these mm. women um, and so there's been a lot of study of them, of what is the importance of the land that you're from in terms of the health of a human being? Um, what does it do to a person's health to be displaced from their actual land? And what does it do to be able to return? And so when you speak of your siblings who've returned, saying like, I'll take the carjackings, I'll take the low wages, I'll take the hurricane, this is, do you feel like in a way they're doing sort of spiritually better than your siblings who have stayed in um, California or Texas or Florida? Uh, that, that's an amazing story. I don't it's know incredible. if they're doing that's. I have to go read that immediately. There's a documentary about them and, and you, you will, your life will never be the same after okay. meeting these women. I, got, I thought, if, I I thought wrote, I'm already obsessed. I'm in already the margins obsessed. I wrote, uh, when I read about Carl, I wrote, Carl is a Chernobyl crone. Um, you know, he's, he's one yeah. of those who at any cost came back to like magnet, like, like came back to the land for his own well being. Um, yeah, so I'm just maybe it's not your place to say how how your family's doing it. That might be too invasive a question, but I, but I wonder about that about um, how a place itself can make you well, 
even if the place itself isn't healthy? You know, I don't know how my other, how my siblings feel who haven't come home, but I, I think I could say something about the draw of the land and the place and what resonates with me about that story. You know, Carl, for me, the character that Carl became in the book was a, was a maroon. I, I was reading a lot about Louisiana maroons in particular and the way that they would live in the cypress swamps and sort of make yes. there. Right, right, right. And, and really that they found their sustenance and, and you know, and, and of course it was a freedom thing, right? Because right. they were escaping plantations and right. slavery and they said, we will make an economy by digging these trees out of the cypress swamps and and this is the way that we'll live and we just need the bare minimum in order to be free i think that's an oversimplified version but you know you get right. the idea and carl is for me even now that guy mm. he lives on his own register he is you know there's something his presence is satisfying and significant mm. if you're when you're around him you you get the feeling that there is something a lot deeper than what you see and when i went you know i lived in hong kong for a little bit working for time asia and one of and this was when i was like very new reporter and one of my jobs you know the the like the men in the office would write the story and I was a stringer. So they would send me off to these various places. And one place I went to was um, Cambodia um, to Phnom Penh. And, and I just remember being so just taken in by the story of the history of the Khmer Rouge and, yeah. and, and how they were memorializing what happened. And, and, and during one of these trips, I met this old man polishing a boat you know, on the killing fields. And, and he had been polishing this boat since the day the, the Khmer Rouge left. Like this guy came to the spot where all of these skulls were found in the ground and he just polished this massive boat. And I have all these photographs of him. And Carl was that guy for me. I remember many years later writing the book and, and thinking about Carl and Carl was that Cambodian man mm. the boat year after year after dreadful day after dreadful day? What could you possibly be seeing <laughs> in this land and this boat and these right. killing fields? And uh, so, Curl for me, you know, and I think that's why I give him this sort of Shakespearean ending, which actually happened, but where he, you know, fights. There's this kind of sort of battle that happens um, where he, we really see him in those last pages and know what he lives for. Defending the last the piece last of what belongs to his family, defending it physically um, from somebody across the street. You know, like this is like, this is ours, like this far and no further. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that was happening uh -huh. all over New Orleans. Yeah. People were getting into fights over houses that weren't there. Right. And they were saying, there used to be our house here. This right. is our house. I, that is so profound to me because it's what I feel. Wow. That you could remove whatever structure and I'll still be wanting to know and to understand and wanting, straining to see, you know? Sarah Broom. <laughs> it's such an honor to talk to you. Um, Thank you. It's such an honor to read you. And I, and I, I want to go out with a question that I, that I always have. I mean, I always have this question in general about people, but I, I really feel that I want to ask it of you. Um, you grew up in a, in a religious tradition, and you were for a while as a young girl um, very captivated by spirit. Um, by by the Holy Spirit, um, by speaking in tongues, by you know you were we, where you would be overcome, um, mm -hmm. and that was the tradition of, of the church. And you write about it so respectfully, um, as it deserves to be written about, um, and and with, you know, you really own it. You're like this is you know this is why and this is what we were doing and this is what it felt like to to be overcome 
by spirit or to wonder as a child, is this spirit or am I, you know, am I just napping? You know, those part, that part where you're like, not sure. Am I, have I fallen asleep here in the church or have I been taken by God? And I wondered, um, it's not a religious book, but it's a very spiritual book, I feel, um, because I feel the spirit in the calling to you to tell this story. You know, um, to me, I feel that you are answering. I felt in those pages, she's doing what she's being called to do. Um, being called by the, fam by the family history to do, being called by history to do, being called by the gods of writing, you know, to do, mm -hmm. to, to, um, to take on this project. And, and there's a part in the book where you write about how a friend suggested that you write to the house itself, to the yellow house, which is a kind of spiritual exercise. You're writing to the, to the ghost of this house. Mm -hmm. um, and I wondered, I wondered how you see spirit now in your life mm. and where writing is connected in that with you. Um, uh, is it, is writing a spiritual activity for you? Um, are you, what are you guided by? Who, who's calling when you're being called to do this work? Who or what? <laughs> mm, that's such a good question. I think writing for me is very spiritual. I think, thinking is spiritual. I, I think of myself as deeply spiritual. And I, I think of myself as a very ritualistic human being, you know, I need, you know, there's a time I need to wake up when other things are quiet, and I need to sort of begin in a certain way. And I need to sort of get my bearings and be quiet so I can listen, you know. And I think the thing I actually learned in church was first of all note taking because I was such a voracious note taker and I still have all those notebooks and I really learned how to listen for the thing that you would want to remind yourself of when you were alone right mm -hmm. not that not mm -hmm. every word was important that mm -hmm. that we in fact edit what we hear and and to pay attention to the ways we edit what we're hearing um and and so writing, maybe gardening is the only thing that can compare for me, is is the the only time that I am quietly sitting with all of my contradictions and fears and shynesses and complete worries and but I am making it. I am composing something, right? Which contains those things, but isn't entirely those things. Um, because, you know, when I'm writing, there is great control, great control. Um, and, but I am sort of in service to, and, and I think in terms of who inspires me and who I'm right, who's calling me, it's all of the women who have written, the black women particularly, who have been writers before me, who help, have helped me hear, learn to hear, learn to listen. And um, immediately I think of course of Toni Morrison, but then also Gail Jones and Irma Broadbear and, you know, Nikki Giovanni and, you know, um, all of these incredible women, including Elizabeth Hardwick, who's one of my favorites, mm. and 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 the and my grandmother and these women in this maternal line who I come from, who renamed themselves as an act of power mm. and as an act of ownership, um, and said, "I don't care what I was named. You're going to call me this." Um, and and so it is all spiritual for me. And I, I hope in the work that is forthcoming that it stays that that it is listening work, you know. Um another thing I thought of when I was reading is um in the in the in the Bible and one of I don't know which which of the gospels it's in, but when Mary is approached and, and told that she's going to carry the, that she's going to carry the, the Christ baby. And, and she says, if it is to be so, let it be so with me. 
Um, mm -hmm. And I, I, I don't know why that just kept coming to me as I was reading these pages. Cause I, I mean, I'm going back to the, to the beginning and, and to me comparing you to, to Homer, which um, thank you for, for allowing me to, <laughs> that comparison. I think it's, I think it's accurate. I think it's, I think it's apt. Um, you know, there's a, there's a line there in the first book of the Aeneid where, where Aeneas, where Dido asks Aeneas to tell the story of, of what mm -hmm. happened to the city of Troy and what happened to his people, what happened to his family. Um, and, and he says, wait, I want to get it right because I wrote it down. He says, sorrows too deep to bear, your majesty. You order me to tell and feel once more. Mm -hmm. um, and it's such, a, it's such a big thing that you took on to, to share these sorrows too deep to bear. Um, but you did it with majesty. Thank you. And Thank you. if it was to be done, it should have been done through you. So um, I hope you know that because I know that the, the sense of who gets to tell a story Am I allowed? Do I have the right? Um, I hope at this point, having seen what the book has become, I just hope you know um, that if it was to be so, it, it needed to be so through you. So we all thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Such an honor to talk to you. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. It was so beautiful, Liz. Thank you. you. You read with such care. And even in your who you compared or who you thought about when you were reading there was such grace and and you really were so broad in your thinking and i really appreciate that and respect that that doesn't always happen well it's so my, thank you. it's my honor and you you make it easy <laughs> thank you you make it easy to compare you to homer trust me <laughs> sarah m broom um the author of the yellow house um and a majestic and epic work of art. Um, thank you so much for, for joining thank us. You. And um, thank you to everybody who is with us here today and, and all the best to you and to your extraordinary family. Thank you so much, Liz. Thanks. I appreciate it. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye.